Hello, uh, my name is Pritish Kakar. I'm a senior computer graphics engineer at Adobe. I will be presenting today about <coughs> implementing foveated rendering with OpenXR and Vulkan. Let's get started. Uh, let's look at the agenda. Uh, so we are going to first talk about what is foveated rendering and how is OpenXR applications make made. Uh, we're going to talk about, you know, uh, how to retrieve iGaze information from an OpenXR API. Um, then we will understand a little bit about uh, how fragment shading rate, also known as variable rate shading, works in Vulkan. Um, then we will talk about fragment density map extension. Um, that is uh, code to implementing foveated rendering. And then we will look at the implementation specifically uh, implementing um, static foveated rendering as well as dynamic foveated rendering. <coughs> Let's get started. Uh, so what is foveated rendering? Uh, so the idea with the foveated rendering is that it's a technique um, that basically reduces the image quality in the area of a display that are not uh, in direct uh, you know, line of sight for a user. So the idea is if you, as a human, uh, your eyes are mostly focused on what is called foveal area, uh, where you perceive the most high fidelity details. Um, the rest of the, the peripheral area, like uh, near peripheral or mid peripheral or far peripheral, uh, it's, a, it's an important area uh, and it, it plays a key role in motion perception, but it's not that much plays a key role in, you know, having um, spatial high fidelity detail in that area. So the idea with the foveate rendering is if you could render in such a way as shown in this figure um, in the middle of the slide, uh, where the center circle has the most um, you know, high fidelity, then the outer circle has a little bit less and the rest of area has um, less fidelity. Even then as a user, you will not be able to you know, see, um, uh, see the difference uh, since your eye would be focused on that narrow area and uh, that's where you want to spend most of your GPU resources. So the idea is um, you want to reduce the pixel shading rate uh, around uh, the areas which is not exactly in the user um, uh, uh, line of sight and you want to focus on the area which is in the user line of sight and you, that's where you want to use, uh, you know, um, same uh, more uh, one fragment for let's say one pixel versus one fragment for multiple pixels. Uh, as the next thing, let's talk a little bit about what is how OpenXR work and will not go much into detail. This is just a brief overview. The idea is you have XR instance, very similar to, you know, an way of application connecting to OpenXR runtime. Um, then you have a system ID, uh, it's just a way of representing a unique ID for a particular VR headset. Then you select a configuration type, a view configuration type, which in this case would be mostly stereo. Uh, but the options available are mono as well. Um, then you create a session, which is a way of, you know, managing the life cycle of the application and providing any, you know, input data, like getting, um, uh, it, it serves basically as an application, uh, you know, session for that particular application. Uh, then you have an XR space, which is represent the 3D coordinate system of that particular XR environment and, the, you know, uh, can help you map objects in that 3D environment. Uh, XR swap chain is very similar to swap chain concepts in Vulkan. Um, and then the most important part is your render loop, which is where you have to call XR wait frame, then begin frame and then end frame. And this is how OpenXR is structured. And the reason you want to call um, wait frame is because it throttles your application frame loop um, to make sure that it's in sync with the, you know, uh, the display basically. So you want to um, uh, the uh, it basically synchronizes your application frame submission with the display in in, in short form. Uh, now let's move to next slide. Uh, so in this slide we will look at uh, how we're going to retrieve eye gauge information from OpenXR. Uh, I've tried to not really write the code, but instead use a flowchart because it's easier for to understand than writing you know verbose codes and um, considering. Um, OpenXR and Vulkan is pretty verbose API. It's it's a bit difficult to put them in slides. Um, so in this flowchart, um, we first check if the iGaze extension is available or not using XR create uh, extra sorry XR instance create info. 
this is very similar to extensions that we will check if we would be writing Vulkan code and we will do that in during the bootstrapping time. So this is exactly we are doing some initialization, checking that. Um, then we will create an action shared um, and create a, you know, I guess extension, um, I guess action, uh, which is uh, part of, you know, uh, normal uh, way of how things are done in OpenXR. You have to create an action for anything that you're going to be tracking. Um, then you have to, you know, bind that accent to a certain path so that it provides a way of, uh, um, you know, um, providing a way of how the application will be able to interpret this data. And uh, then you have to do what we call as action space setup. Uh, in this, you are just telling what is your data that you need is going to be, ref uh, you know, what is going to be your view reference space. So in this case, we will provide XR reference space type view. And this will make sure that our gaze tracking is anchored to the user perspective, ensuring that our gaze calculation give us from the user's viewpoint. Um, so at each frame uh, during our runtime render loop, uh, we will call XR, you know, begin frame, like I said in the previous slide, we will call update the gaze state, uh, and this will ensure um, and then we'll query if the uh, action um, state position is valid or not. If it's a valid, that means the, it's a stable position as per the device. And uh, we could use that to calculate uh, where the user is looking in pixel coordinate. And uh, this will ensure that now we know uh, which pixel coordinate we want to pay more attention to and be shading it at a higher rate compared to other pixels. Uh, so let's move to the next slide. Now we will talk about variable rate shading. So the idea with variable rate shading is to basically specify a shading rate such that a fragment invocation is applied to multiple shader, uh, multiple pixels instead of, you know, a single pixel. So usually when you invoke a fragment shader, um, it's uh, mostly um, unless um, unless you are using anti-aliasing and you are using multi you know sampling, it's one fragment uh, shade is shades one pixel. Um, but uh, what this extension allows you to do is it allows you to specify different um, shading frag uh, fragment rates. Like for example, you can say one by one, one by two, two by one, two by two, uh, which tells you how many one fragment invocation is going to sample or it's, it's going to write to how many pixels. So for example, in two by two, uh, one fragment uh, shader execution is going to be writing to four pixels uh, um, as shown in the diagram on the bottom right. Uh, so the way to, uh, you know, apply the uh, VRS or variable rate shading is to specify a frag size, uh, which could be any of those patterns that are specified in this bottom right. And then you have something called shading rate combiner operations. Uh, and I will go through that a little bit later. And then you execute, uh, you know, fragment shading rate command, uh, basically by providing the fragment size and the uh, operations. Um, now coming to the operations, uh, basically, uh, the shading rate, the final shading rate can be controlled through three mechanisms. So we have the ability to specify a shading rate when you create a pipeline. We have the ability to specify a primitive shading rate and we have a ability to specify attachment shading rate. And this combiner operation lets you specify how these operations, basically how you are going to combine these three um, um, three shading rates that is coming from pipeline, primitive and attachment. So you can either use keep or uh, use replace or use min or max or use multiply. So it's basically a two step combination process in the very first uh, operation. Uh, we combine the pipeline shading rate and the primitive shading rate. Uh, the primitive shading rate can be written using GL primitive shading rate extension in any shaders uh, which are pre-rasterization uh, pre stages like vortex shader, geometry shader. It has to be the last pre-raster shade, shader. Uh, so if you are only using, let's say, fragment and vortex shader, you will write this in a, um, in a vortex shader. And uh, then the 
the combination process, as I was explaining for um, combiner operations, is we are going to take the primitive shading rate and pipeline shading rate and then use whatever it's uh, whatever is specified in the combiner operation at index zero. The result of that, along with the attachment shading rate, is then used by what is specified in the combiner operation one and that is the final shading rate that is used for that particular uh, pixel. Um, so this is the high level overview of uh, you know how the shading combiner uh, help. It basically lets you now control um, the shading rate, uh, gives you more final control. So it's not only based on you know attachment or primitive or pipeline, it's a combination of those depending on how you wanna use by using these combiner operations. Uh, let's move to the next slide. So let's understand what is now fragment density map. So the idea with the fragment density map is it's a, it's a another it's just another texture. It's not at the same resolution at you, as your uh, frame buffers are, but it's a lower resolution texture. And uh, the idea is it helps you uh, do the fragment shading rate management. But instead of you specifying it through pipelines, primitive, and you know attachment you actually create this texture that you pass to the render uh, that should attach to the render pass and this texture uh, decides what fragment shading rate would be used uh, uh, when you are trying to uh, render a frame and uh, the single fragment uh, uh, density map or fragment density map texture can be used across multiple frames but now you can imagine if the user moves or the focus changes then you will have to update this uh, fragment density map and you have to rebuild it all the time. Um, you can store this as uh, in, a for, in a Vulkan format R8 uint or R8 G8 uint, uh, depending upon how much you wanna control and how you wanna control the, uh, the, the fragment uh, shading rate, uh, whether you wanna just control um, it uh, uh, vertically and horizontally um, in the same uh, same uh, same ratio, or you want to have a different uh, ratio. Uh, so, so one texel of this, since the fragment uh, density map texture is a lower resolution, one texel of this would map to the multiple you know area of the render target, multiple pixels of the render target. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much what the basic idea of fragment density map is. Uh, Let's move next to how we are going to implement static uh, foveated rendering uh, uh, using a fragment density map. Uh, so the idea with the static map is uh, limited uh, to uh, is pretty much uh, basically like I explained before in the in the previous slide. We basically calculate um, this fragment density map. Uh, so this this is how this this flow diagram basically explains how to do that. Um, so in this case, we have to query a fragment uh, uh, density map uh, extension uh, to make sure that it's supported first of all. Then we have to make sure that we can query what is the min and max, you know, texture size that we can use. And then we are when we are creating this fragment density map uh, texture, we have to make sure we provide it. Uh, um, the image uses fragment density map bit extension. Uh, and then the format can be R8, G8, or R8, depending upon you know whether we want to control horizontally and vertically separately. Uh, then we simply set up the images. Uh, we create image with two layers, and uh, um, uh, since we have multi-view, we are doing stereo rendering. We will have an image uh, view for each layer, um, and uh, we will update the data for the first and the second layer, and then we will have to make sure that we transition the layout to density map op op optimal. Um, during the render pass, we have to create the attachment description. We have to um, ensure that uh, one of the important thing is to ensure that uh, fragment density map is uh, not uh, part of the color or the depth attachment, but we uh, have to create another um, uh, VK render pass fragment density map create info extension and add that when we are creating a render pass create info uh, in, in the render pass create info next chain. Um, then we do the frame buffer setup. Uh, we add uh, FTM image view to our 
we can create a frame buffer info and we attach index with you know normal Vulkan stuff basically we set up for frame buffer for each eye and that's pretty much what you need to do so you have this FTM texture that you have certain data based on where your eye position is you fill some detail there uh, you have marked let's say all of the image with the zero entry but where the user is looking you mark that with a with a certain value and that's that's pretty much you know it's just a it's just a like let's say 32 by 32 texture um, and based upon where the user is looking uh, this would uh, it would it would update the uh, it would it would basically render that area with high fidelity while the rest would be you know uh, using uh, more uh, one fragment for multiple pixels um, but as you can imagine um, you have to recompute if the user is moving you have to recompute every time on each frame could be or, or any or on any user movement and that is very you know heavy for cpu and that's pretty much you know uh, kills the whole point of having ftm because now we have created a bottleneck there uh, this is where dynamic fovea rendering helps. Uh, let's go through its implementation quickly. Uh, so the dynamic fovea rendering requires a, a, a fragment density map of some Qualcomm extension, uh, which is passed to which we need to query uh, whether the physical device supports it or not by using VK physical divide fragment density map offset feature Qualcomm. If it's supported, that's only when we can use it. And if it's supported, then we have to pass VK um, uh, create fragment density map offset bit cool Qualcomm. Um, this is a specific extension uh, with the, from Qualcomm um, that helps you do dynamic populated rendering without having to you know create a, a fragment density map on CPU all the time, uh, but your device has to support it and so in the in the last slide um, in in this slide we will go through how what's the process of um, you know specifying um, the uh, the data is we will get the fragment density map properties like fragment density map offsets fragment density offset granularity um, and uh, then we will just create a device with that offset extension name we will create an uh, fdm texture where we will provide Oh, um, this particular VK image create fragment density map offset bit QCOM, which specify that our FTM texture is going to be using uh, this uh, offset uh, data, uh, which is provided by this extension. Uh, now, once we have created the device using these steps, uh, we can simply start our render loop. We will get eye position, like I was, like I described in the uh, getting the eye gaze direction. From there, we will be able to calculate the offset locations at where the user is focusing on. We will also have FDM granularity data that can be used to apply, um, you know, alignment uh, to the offsets that we calculated. These are um, these. Uh, it, it's basically, you know, the this offset uh, uh, data or the density offset granularity data determines the smallest offset that can be applied to fragment density map um, and uh, it's uh, it needs to be aligned uh, because of the hardware constraints um, and then we will pass uh, we will uh, create an render pass uh, um, like we do in uh, Vulkan uh, we will create a VK sub pass fragment density map offset uh, and provide the density offset count and the offsets and then we will end the sub pass uh, using the subpass info so that's pretty much uh, the high level of how to um, create uh, the Vulkan uh, how to use this extension again um, on the shader side now you don't have to do anything but uh, you could basically um, update this offset and based upon this offset your Qualcomm uh, your your fragment uh, <coughs> sorry based on the fragment density map offset you are uh, your your device would be uh, using that particular data and or the align or the data from the textures uh, to decide where user is looking at so now you are not relying on creating and filling this 32 by 32 texture for example 
on the CPU again and again, but you can control it by just providing the offset uh, based on where user was looking at. And that's pretty much it. Thank you.